Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on Brexit and UK legislation navigating retained EU law. This session is the second of our Brexit webinar series. Uh, so they're going to be taking place every Thursday at 10 a.m. and we'll cover the cross-cutting issues uh, that are affecting companies uh, both in the UK uh, and further afield uh, in the EU uh, and in other countries as well. And we'll be offering practical solutions to how you navigate uh, these choppy Brexit waters. Um, so I'll just start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name's Eleanor Deuce. I'm the director here at Field Fisher. And uh, prior to uh, being at Field Fisher, I was like Andy Hood, uh, who spoke last week, a UK government lawyer. And in terms of experience, um, I've done negotiations in Brussels on the GDPR. Um, but my uh, final job before I left government was working as a senior lawyer in the department for exiting the EU. And I worked on the core provisions of the legislation that I'm going to talk to you about this morning, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. And um, I also worked on aspects as well of the withdrawal agreement and the framework for the future EU-UK relationship. And I have um, recently finished writing a book on the European Union Withdrawal Act, um, published by the Law Society. It's going to come out relatively soon. Um, and my co-author uh, on that book uh, was Indira Rao, who is counsel for EU and international law in the House of Commons. Um, so if you want to know more about this subject, um, our book uh, will be uh, ready relatively shortly. Right, so just to mention as well before we start that if you've got questions, um, please do put those into the um, questions box that you'll see on the control panel um, on the right hand side of the screen and we will aim to take those questions um, at the end of this webinar. Um, but if we don't get your question, don't worry because uh, we will write to you with an answer to the question that you have posed. And this session will also be available on our YouTube channel. So let's get started then. So UK legislation after Brexit, navigating retained EU law. So Andy Hood talked last week about what comes next from the international perspective. I'm now looking at what comes next from the domestic perspective. So what happens at the end of the transition period at the end of this year? Well, EU law, as it applied to the UK at that moment that we end the transition period, will be saved and turned into domestic law. So that encompasses the direct EU legislation, the regulations, for example, that flowed into domestic law. Those will be saved. Um, and turned into UK law, and also the domestic legislation which implemented EU law will also be saved. And that law together will form a new body of law in our legal system called retained EU law. And I'm going to talk to you about that in more detail. So retained EU law is created by the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 when we first started drafting this uh, legislation in government, uh, we were envisaging that this would be a no deal bill, as it were. This would be something that kicked in to make sure that the UK economy was regulated in the same way post exit as it was then compared with before exit. So that's, that's what we were thinking of. So those reciprocal rights and obligations would disappear overnight, but the way in which we were regulated would remain because we would keep the law from the EU that we were all familiar with. So that's what the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 was originally about. 
Now it's going to be applying in most areas where you have EU law at the end of the transition period. And I'm going to call this act the EUA because there's some very confusing terminology in the Brexit uh, domestic law landscape and legislation that sounds really quite familiar, which I'll come on to in a moment. But the EUA is the legislation that we're going to be focusing on this morning. So what's the structure of this session going to be? Well, I'm going to tell you what you need to know about the UK legislative landscape at the end of the transition period. And I'm going to give you a sense of how the EUA operate, operates and what it does. And then I'm going to go on to talk about why it matters to your business and your organisation. So what should you get out of this session? Well, by the end of the session, hopefully you'd be able to better explain to somebody in your company what the main legislative changes are going to be in the UK at the end of the transition period and the key themes in the EU. So firstly, I think it's useful to look a little to the international um, plane and to see how that then translates into the UK domestic legislation that we're going to have at the end of the transition period. So Andy talked last week about the possibility of an extension of this transition period and he put the chances of that as being pretty low and that um, is something that I fully concur with. Uh, the transition period could have been extended in the summer but this government was elected on the mantra get Brexit done and I think it's extremely unlikely that there will be any extension to the transition period so I think the EU treaties will be ceasing to apply to the UK at the end of this year. Now the end of the year um, is going to either be uh, a situation where the UK and the EU are trading on the basis of a deal, um, potentially a limited deal, we think, in not that many areas of the economy, um, but there may be, in the next six to eight weeks, progress in the negotiations and a deal may be struck. On the other hand, it's very possible, given everything that's going on at the moment, that there will not be a treaty to govern future trading between the UK and the EU. Now, the legislation that I'm going to talk about will come into effect when there's no trade deal between the EU and the UK or a limited deal. So it won't apply if there's an extension to the transition period, but as I said, I think that's unlikely. So this is what's going to happen where there isn't a future trading treaty with the EU or where that treaty um, has been agreed, but it's going to be a limited one. So the way to think about the UK legislative landscape at the end of the transition period is in terms of these four pillars that I've set out for you. And I'm going to go through um, what each of those are. Um, so firstly, we've got the EUA 2018, which I talked about. So that uh, legislation will apply in most cases because the deals that we're going to have, if we have them with the EU, will be, as I said, relatively narrow in scope. So where you're currently regulated um, by legislation that comes from the EU, then uh, the EUA will be the baseline. That will, is what will apply in most cases. So the EUA 2018. The next pillar is the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020. And it's really confusing um, because <laughs> that sounds pretty much like the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. So notice the difference in the years. Um, but also um, there is a really profound difference, which is that the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020 came in at the beginning of this, this year and it implements certain aspects of the deal which was struck between the government and the EU. And so an example of um, what the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020 implements is the citizens' rights provisions in the withdrawal agreement. So um, 
EU citizens who've come to the UK under EU free movement rights are given rights in domestic law through this legislation. So that's the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020. Next, the next pillar is new domestic frameworks. And uh, I've used the example of the Internal Market Bill, which at the end of this uh, year uh, will presumably turn into the um, Internal Market Act 2020. We've got other frameworks as well in agriculture. There's a trade bill going through Parliament at the moment as well. So this third pillar represents that legislation. That's where we've got completely new domestic frameworks. And finally, we've got um, legislation that would implement any future trade deal with the EU. Um, we don't know what that's going to look like, which is why I've given it that not very snappy title. But um, that's the fourth pillar, as it were, of domestic legislation that we can expect to see um, coming into force um, at the end of the transition period, at the end of this year. So how do those four pillars of legislation actually fit together? Well, this um, not very sophisticated diagram attempts to illustrate that. So in blue, because we don't know what the legislation is going to be called, um, at the top there, we've got the legislation implementing um, the trade deal. We've got the uh, domestic frameworks that I talked about, so the Internal Market Act 2020, the Agriculture Act, this will be the Trade Act, um, those new domestic frameworks there, and finally, the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020, um, implementing aspects of the withdrawal agreement, such as the citizens' rights provisions. Now, they're all there at the top because this diagram illustrates a hierarchy. They displace any uh, savings um, or any legislation which um, came to us uh, from the EU, either during um, our membership or during the transition period. So they are higher up in the hierarchy. So if in your area you've got a new domestic framework, well, then that will displace the functioning of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 and the law that you're used to will go and you'll be subject to these new regimes. So that's why those are there, are there at the top. But they're quite thin because in most cases, as I said, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 is what will apply in the context of your um, formerly EU rights and obligations, the law that came from the EU. So um, that's what will apply in most cases, that's the baseline. And under that, I've also mentioned the EU exit regulations. Why have I done that? Well, the law that's saved by the EUA, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, doesn't work when you just turn it into domestic law and leave it like that because it's got matters of references to um, EU agencies, EU institutions, and it contains reciprocal rights and obligations which will no longer apply. So the EU exit regulations, and there are about 600 of them, come in and make specific changes in particular areas. So those are numerous, as I said, um, around 600. And they make really quite specific changes um, that you will need to get your head around for your particular area because those could be quite far reaching, those changes. Right, so that is a, a, a picture of the hierarchy, as it were, um, in terms of the domestic legislation that we'll have um, at the end of the transition period. So now I'm going to look in a little bit more detail at what EUA does. As I mentioned before, it saves EU law and turns it into domestic law. So uh, EU uh, legislation that applied directly in our law becomes domestic law and the domestic law which implements EU obligations is saved. And a new category of law is introduced, retained EU law, which comprises both that domestic legislation and the direct EU legislation, for example, EU regulations. So what do you need to know about the EUA? Well, I've put here five main themes. Firstly, that it's displaced by new legislation, and we've covered that already now. Secondly, that it contains some quite significant signposts, which are at times not very easy to spot. So I'm going to uh, 
explain what those are and point some out to you so that you don't end up on the wrong path in terms of your interpretation. I'm going to talk about the foundations of the legislation, how it really is based in EU law and the European Communities Act 1972. So if you understand how EU law and the European Communities Act worked, then you will have a good understanding of how the EUA operates. I'm going to look at the two main themes in the EUA, continuity and change. And I'm going to talk about arguments where uh, you might be able to put forward new ways um, of dealing with this legislation. So scope for innovation, new arguments, both from uh, you as businesses and organisations, but also I'm going to cover where government has made some innovative changes potentially in our domestic legal system. So signposts, what's all that about? Well, as I said, um, there are some areas where uh, there will be just a few words, three or four words, which are really important. And um, in writing the book, we've noticed that some commentators have missed those signposts and ended up um, interpreting you a in a way which wasn't intended. So it's sparsely drafted. There's not that much um, there sometimes, just a few words to point you in the right direction. So those signposts are absolutely crucial for arriving at the right outcome in terms of your interpretation. So I talked about um, just earlier that I was going to go into a little bit about the foundations of the UN. And this picture here is from the explanatory notes uh, to the EUA when, it, when we first published it as a bill. And this was the thing that everyone um, commented on on Twitter. They said, oh, that picture looks like um, some drinks at a bar, one of which has a couple of ice cubes in it. Um, so, but it's a rather nice illustration of the foundations of the EUA because you've got EU law at the one hand, on the one hand and UK law on the other. And this, um, as it was called in the case of Miller by the Supreme Court, this conduit pipe of the European Communities Act, Section 2.1 of the European Communities Act, which allows EU law to flow into UK domestic law. And you'll see that um, in the wording of EUA and, and in the way that it deals with concepts, um, the European Communities Act is really present. And that's Section 2.1, the words from Section 2.1 are repeated uh, through the legislation. So that's really key to understand. And in terms of how that functioned during the UK's EU membership and during the transition period, of course, there were two, these are the two ice cubes, as it were, in e e UK law. Um, firstly, some legislation simply came through Section 2.1 through that conduit pipe and didn't need further implementing legislation in domestic law. So for example, rights in the treaties or regulations. So that's one segment. And the other segment, um, is EU law like directives that needed to be implemented through domestic legislation. So that's um, a brief illustration of uh, how EU law and UK law operated and is part of the foundations of the EUA. Now I talked about the main themes being continuity and change. So one of the main purposes of the EUA was to ensure, as I said, that uh, areas um, regulated by EU law uh, didn't suddenly change. We didn't have a, a big change in how our economy was regulated at the end um, of the transition period. So continuity is one of the really key themes of the EUA. And here I've got one of these signposts. It's just a few words, but that is a signpost to point to the fact that continuity is what you should be considering, that um, as the law had effect prior to the end of the transition period, it continues to have that effect after the end of the transition period. So that's continuity. But then there are quite profound changes as well made by the EUA. And that is um, set out and signposted by these words, which you will see through the legislation as well. There is no right in domestic law to um, rely on the Charter of Fundamental Rights, to Frankovich damages, that sort of thing. So those two things of continuity and change are really important. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on the theme of continuity. So retained EU law is comprised, um, as I said, of domestic law, which implements EU obligations, direct EU law, like regulations, and rights, like rights from 
the EU treaties, which applied directly in domestic law. And retained EU law should be interpreted in the way that it was before. So in accordance with the general principles of EU law, such as proportionality and non-discrimination, the way in which you interpret EU law still applies. So you can still look at other language versions of the um, legislation that you're looking at. You can still use the recitals to interpret it. And you should interpret retained EU law in light of the case law from before the end of the transition period. So both domestic case law, but also um, case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And all of that is about continuity, about making sure that the law means the same thing after the end of the transition period as it did before. What about the change? What changes are going to be brought about by the EUA? Well, directives are not saved into um, domestic law by the EUA. And the reason for that is that directives are essentially an instruction to member states to legislate. So the legislation itself has been saved, um, but the instruction to legislate hasn't. But there is one really significant difference in terms of how directives are treated. They can still be used as an aid to interpretation. We still got the duty of consistent interpretation. But if you want to make a new argument after the transition period ends that a directive had direct effect, that's not going to be possible. The EU blocks those arguments. The Charter of Fundamental Rights will no longer apply in domestic law. Why is that? Um, well, as the legislation was going through the uh, House, uh, through Parliament, ministers set out that the Charter of Fundamental Rights has never actually been the source of any rights in domestic law. It's simply codified uh, those rights or made them more visible. So now that the Charter of Fundamental Rights no longer applies, the rights still are there in our law, but we have to go looking for them. We can't just rely on the Charter and say Article 47 of the Charter says X, Y and Z. Um, we have to go to the source of the rights instead. So that's a change. The general principles of EU law will no longer apply as the basis for a claim. So, for example, there was a case quite recently, a case of Walker, um, where a same sex couple um, put forward the argument that it was discriminatory that they did not receive the same pension rights as heterosexual couples. And uh, the domestic legislation, which allowed for that discrimination, was found to have breached the general principle of non discrimination. Now, that case won't be undone um, after the end of the um, transition period, but you can't bring forward a new uh, case based on the general principles. So that sort of challenge will no longer apply in domestic law. And Frankovich damages, um, cases against the state for failure to implement EU law properly will no longer apply either. So those are the changes which are made. Another profound change which I touched on is the change or changes made by the EU exit regulations under the Section 8 powers in the EUA. So, as I said, if you simply save EU law and turn it into domestic law, it's full of references which no longer work. So, for example, you've got references to the European Commission. Those will be changed to the Secretary of State. But there'll be much more profound changes which have happened. And I'm going to give an illustration of some of those a bit later. But you do really need to look at your particular area of practice and look at those regulations and see what's happened. Because as I say, there can be really quite significant changes which have been made in order to allow um, retained EU law to still operate as standalone legislation, which no longer gives effect to the rights and obligations which were in the, in the um, it, reciprocal, essentially, um, when the UK was um, an EU member state. So I talked um, briefly about innovation. What new arguments might you be able to make under the EUA? Well, uh, the EUA actually allows for new arguments that um, the EU treaties had direct effect. It doesn't preclude those arguments. So it might be possible to argue in a domestic court after the end of the transition period that certain articles of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union have direct effect and should therefore be used to disapply conflicting domestic law, which stems from our pre-exit, pre-transition, end of transition period um, 
phase. So pre-existing um, domestic law might be able to be disapplied on the basis, for example, and I've just given a couple of examples of candidates for this sort of argument, possibly Article 16 of the Treaty um, on the Functioning of the European Union, uh, which relates to data protection, or Article 19 of the TFEU, uh, which relates to discrimination. So there's potential for novel arguments there to be made under the US. And another innovation which is worth mentioning as well is that under the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020, the EUA was amended and it was amended to allow ministers to prescribe a test to the UK courts, which would mean that they were no longer bound by retained EU case law. So quite a potentially profound um, difference or, or change um, brought about by the um, Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020. Now, there's been a consultation on the use of this power. And what the consultation said uh, was that uh, the domestic court should be able to depart from retained EU case law where it was right to do so. So that's potentially the test that courts are going to be facing at the end of the transition period um, if this legislation is made, and we don't know yet, the government is now uh, looking at the consultation it did and is going to be responding to that shortly. Um, I should also mention that this power to prescribe that test to the courts is sunsetted, so it can't be used um, once the transition period has ended. And I've just mentioned on the slide there, IP completion day. It's worth mentioning that that means implementation period completion day, because the government um, called the transition period the implementation period um, for a long time and so the legislation reflects that old name. Now they've moved <laughs> to a different position and they call the transition period the transition period and some of my friends who are involved in the drafting were a bit irritated about that because they said oh well our, our withdrawal agreement at 2020 um, talks about IP completion day but nobody else is talking about it but what it means is the end of the transition period so worth knowing that. So let me just summarise now what I've been through and what you need to know. So you need to know that the EU is one of the four pillars of um, end of the transition period legislation. Um, so it applies where there's no free trade agreement with the EU, um, where the withdrawal agreement doesn't make for different provision, or um, where there isn't, um, where there's new domestic legislation as well, the EU will not apply. So it doesn't apply um, where you've got that new legislation coming in. Its foundations are in EU law and in the functioning of the European Communities Act 1972. So the focus is on uh, continuity, but there are also some really profound changes created there. Um, it introduces this new concept of retained EU law, and there are also um, real, really quite um, uh, important um, exceptions that you need to get your um, head round in relation to retained EU law and changes which are made by the EU um, exit regulations as well. Uh, so it's not just about um, keeping everything the same. And there are also innovative arguments that can be made under, uh, under the US. So to do with the direct effect of treaty articles, but also um, innovations in, in terms of the government and the power to prescribe this test of when courts can depart from retained case law. So why does this matter? Well, this really is the effect of Brexit kicking in properly. This is where um, we really are going to see some profound change in the way that um, our legislation operates. So there are five main changes that you should consider this is a really complex matrix here of legislation that we've got coming in. Um, we've got potentially um, new domestic systems created under the EU exit regulations. So do have a look at those in detail because you will find potentially that there are some really key changes that you need to be aware of. Um, we might have some new domestic regulators. That's relatively rare. The EU exit regulations tend to take um, regulatory functions from the EU institutions and give them to pre-existing UK um, regulators. But do have a look, who's going to be regulating your activities at the end of the transition period? There will be loss of grounds of challenge, and I've mentioned those um, in a bit of detail um, earlier, and potential for relatively speedy divergence if the, if the government does make these 
these regulations that I've mentioned from the case law that we are all familiar with. So I do hope that now at the end of this session that you're um, better able to explain to your organisation what the main legislative changes are at the end of the transition period and the key themes in the UR. Um, I haven't, I'm afraid, left all that much time for questions, um, but um, I've got a couple um, which which um, have been asked. Um, so uh, I think uh, I think it's worth um, just answering um, one or two. Um, so how long is retained EU law going to stay on the statute book? Um, will it be five years? Will it be 10 years? Um, it's going to be around for a long time. There's a huge segment of our legislation that comes from the EU. It's going to take um, some years to repeal that and replace that. So retained EU law will probably be around until all of us have um, stopped practicing. So this is a long-term change. Um, in our legislative landscape. Um, and uh, another question that I've been asked is, um, you know, looking at the EU exit regulations and the changes that they've made, um, in fact, um, some of it doesn't really hang together. Um, and uh, the question is, what, what do you make of that? Um, this has all been done at breakneck speed. And um, I think if you find that the changes in your area don't necessarily hang together that well or make that much sense. Don't be surprised by that because um, this, this has all been done, as I say, very, very quickly. And departments, government departments or other agencies that have made these changes haven't necessarily had the time to sit down and think through the policy and think through how um, the end of the transition period looks. So don't expect this all to be seamless and to work um, really beautifully because unfortunately it won't. Um, I don't think I've got time unfortunately for any further questions but I I will answer them. Um, so uh, so don't worry, we'll, we'll say them all and we'll, we'll go back to you individually um, with responses. Um, I just want to mention here at the end, um, we've got various practical Brexit checklists so if, if you need to do some planning in this area, we've got uh, the checklist, we've got carry on contracting, we've got our Field Fisher and Brexit blog. So do have a look at that. Um, and also we have uh, our Brexit task force hotline. So do get in touch with Andy Hood, his um, contact details are there. Um, if you've got any particular queries, we are here to help. Um, so here are my contact details as well. If you've got queries about the UK legislative landscape at the end of the transition period, or you're finding your particular area and the EU exit regulations really difficult to get on top of, please, please do get in touch. Um, our next session is going to be on the 24th of September, so next Thursday, and we're going to be looking at competition law. So the impact of Brexit in the field of competition law. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, I will come back to you on your questions and thank you for posing them. And um, good luck with your uh, Brexit preparations. All the best. Thank you.